Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And today we will have a very nice uh, talk by Dr. Humberto Campins from the University of Central Florida in Ontario, United States. And he will talk, he will talk about this uh, planetary defense uh, solutions. Uh, Dr. Humberto Campins studies asteroids, especially those that can be threatened Earth with an impact. He's a Pegasus professor of physics and astronomy and head of the planetary science group at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. In 2010, he led, he led the team that discovered water ice and organic molecule, molecules on asteroid 24 Temis. This was published in the journal Nature, adding weight to the idea that some of the Earth water come from asteroids. He was a 2021-2022 Jefferson Science Fellow and served as a science advisor at the UES State Department Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. He's a member of the NASA Osiris Rex Asteroid Sample Return Mission, which is on its way back to Earth and arriving in September of 2023. He also works on European Space Agency projects, including the Euclid, Gaia, and ERA missions. So thank you, Humberto, for being here. And I give you the floor with the talk. Thank you, Rene. It's a pleasure to be back in Granada. Uh, my first uh, visit to the IAA was in 1993. That was actually my father who did that. No. Uh, and, and I gave a talk about the likely impact of a comet that had just been discovered with Jupiter a year later in 1994. Most people in the audience didn't believe me, uh, but uh, Fernando did. And uh, we ended up observing it a year later from the uh, William Herschel Telescope in the Canaries. It was fun. Um, anyway, so uh, it, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, so I'll be telling you a little bit about um, planetary... Can you play Pac-Man here? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so I should use this one? No, no, no. No, okay. Okay, so... Um, there we go. So here's a quick a quick outline of what I'll be telling you about. A quick introduction to asteroid impact hazards. Then these two current collaborations uh, on planetary defense for um, international collaboration for planetary defense, Osiris Rex and Hayabusa two, uh, and then uh, NASA DART. That there are members of the mission here, including Fernando, uh, and uh, and then Lichia Cube and the ERA mission. And then I'll tell you a little bit about my work on OSIRIS-REx, which is still ongoing. And it's the fact that we found rocks on Bennu that formed on another asteroid. And uh, this is a very interesting discovery. Um, okay, so how likely is an asteroid to uh, ruin your day? Not very, as most of you probably know, the chances of that happening while we are alive are so low that as individuals, we don't have to worry about it. Um, we can worry about other things, but this should not make us lose any sleep. Um, as a civilization, though, we must do something because big impacts have happened and big impacts will happen again unless we uh, do something about it. Uh, the uh, dinosaurs did not have a planetary defense office and uh, they're not with us anymore. So uh, uh, we, the Planetary Defense Office in, uh, at NASA uh, includes considerable international collaboration for planetary defense. There's a number of, uh, of projects, including the DART mission, which was funded by this office. And it was featured in the recent movie, Don't Look Up. Just for my uh, curiosity, how many of you saw Don't Look Up? Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Now, in reality, my colleagues there are much cooler than in the movie. They would not bring a professor from Michigan State and his graduate student, no matter if she's Jennifer Lawrence, they would not bring them to the White House. They would filter that information and pass it on up. But the movie was, was 
good. I, I thought it was compelling. Um, anyway, so uh, Osiris Rex and uh, Hayabusa 2 and uh, the uh, dark uh, Gia Cuban era are these collaborations that are partly funded by all of these uh, space agencies that are trying to defend our planet against an impact. Um, Osiris Rex uh, is the one I'm a member of, and I'll tell you most about this mission. Hayabusa 2 successfully went to asteroid Ryugu, picked up two different samples and brought them back to Earth. And they're being analyzed. And, and, um, and I'll be telling you a little bit about some of the, the results. Um, and, uh, th and then uh, Osiris Rex picked up one sample in um, uh, October of 2020. And it's will be returning it back to Earth to the Utah desert in uh, September of this year. Okay, so Bennu and Ryugu, uh, a tale of two asteroids, both are potentially hazardous asteroids. So right now we do not know of any asteroid that can cause global devastation that is threatening Earth. So that's nice to know. It's good. We can relax on that front. But there are potentially hazardous asteroids that have orbits that could evolve into one that can threaten Earth in the future. So both Bennu and Ryugu are those. And uh, so they're not an immediate threat, but we have to worry about it. They have similar orbits. Osiris Rex went to Bennu, Hayabusa 2 went to Ryugu. And here's the orbit of Bennu, comes in within the orbit of the Earth slightly, it goes about three quarters of the way to the orbit of Mars. And it has a very low inclination, so it's easy for us to send spacecraft there. And it's also relatively easy for its orbit to evolve into one that would intersect Earth. Um, same with uh, Ryugu, the, the orbit of Ryugu comes slightly within the orbit of the Earth, and it goes essentially all the way out to the orbit of Mars. And I was giving this talk a few months ago, and somebody from the audience said, could we use Ryugu as a way of transporting material from the Earth to Mars? And I hadn't thought about that until that question. And I thought about it for a little while, and it turns out, yes, you can, but you cannot be in a hurry. Um, the, the lining up of the orbit of Ryugu with the Earth and then the lining up of the orbit of Ryugu with Mars, it doesn't, it doesn't help to have uh, Ryugu be here and Mars here, right? It has to line up with Mars. So that, that can take, I don't know, 10 years or so. So if you take a lot of supplies for, for uh, the Martians, for the people that are colonizing Mars, you put them on Ryugu, it's going to take about 10 years to get there, but it's a lot cheaper. So you might just put low, low uh, priority material and do that. Uh, anyway, this is Bennu. In, uh, uh, these are December of 2018 images that we took when we first got there. And we were uh, a little bit surprised at how rocky it was and, um, and its rotation uh, that we didn't know about every 4.3 hours. Um, this is Ryugu, uh, and uh, about six months earlier, obtained with the Hayabusa 2. The two of them look similar, but they're different sizes. Um, and uh, hold on a second. Well, I'll, I'll discuss the, 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 the two sizes and the predictions in a second. So because I, was, I am on OSIRIS-REx, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Our four main themes for OSIRIS-REx were uh, revealing solar system history, so bringing back a sample of a very primitive asteroid to study the organic material and the other components of that uh, of that object to try to understand how uh, the solar system uh, formed and evolved. And most um, importantly for, for our uh, uh, proposal to NASA, the main scientific question that Osiris-Rex was going to pursue was the organic material on these asteroids and what that would tell us about the prebiotic organic material on Earth. I'll discuss that more in a bit. Um, another one would be mitigating impact hazards. I've already told you a little bit about that. So like Bennu and Ryugu, if they're going to threaten the Earth, in, in the case of Bennu, in another 140 years, and we need to deflect it, we need to know as much as possible about it so that our deflection technique works. Um, enabling human exploration. Humans want to get to Mars. Chances are that we're going to have to stop in the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, which are captured asteroids. So by doing uh, uh, activities on Bennu and Ryugu, we are enabling future human exploration of the moons of Mars uh, and 
of uh, the, the uh, um, mission to the surface of Mars. Chances are we would send robots to the moons of Mars to process the material and obtain um, uh, fuel for us to go from the moons of Mars down to the surface of Mars, where we would likely process material there and generate fuel to come back. So we would make several stops, just like Columbus didn't go all the way from uh, mainland Spain to the New World. They, he stopped in the Canary Islands and re uh, and, and got some uh, supplies, right? So we're likely to do that. And then developing a space economy. This is, I think it's particularly uh, interesting because um, asteroids are ideal resources for developing a space economy. Soon, I don't know how soon, but a decade, no more than two, uh, it will be cheaper to process an asteroid and, 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 uh, and obtain water than it will be to launch it. The moment that you get fuel from an asteroid cheaper than it costs to launch it into space, you're gonna have all of these customers that wanna buy it because they're all the Earth's orbiting satellites are gonna want to prefer to buy the fuel cheaper in space than to put it into orbit, which will be more expensive. So that will get a, a, uh, uh, a very vigorous space economy where the people mining the asteroids will be paid by the people who want to buy the fuel in, in, from Earth orbiting satellites. In addition to that, communication and other satellites for, for example, for gathering solar energy uh, can be 3D printed in space with asteroid materials. So we would be printing structures in space that don't have to even withstand the gravity here on the surface of the Earth. They're gonna be operating in a very different environment where they would never have to be put into a small uh, cylinder shaken up you know, uh, subject to several Gs as it goes up uh, into space. So for example, imagine if the 3D printing of most of the Webb Space Telescope in space and only uh, launching the material that was essential to build on Earth and, and incorporating that into the telescope. Instead of building a very complex object uh, telescope that has to fold onto itself, be put into a tube, launched, and then unfold into space, and the reason why it took a lot longer and was a lot more expensive was because they needed to make sure that it worked perfectly because if it didn't, like the Hubble Space Telescope, there was no chance of repairing it. So uh, I think that this is going to open up all kinds of interesting space structures uh, or uh, Earth orbiting structures that never have to be built on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so um, this is something that I was surprised and I guess it showed how uh, naive I was when I was invited onto the OSIRIS-REx team before we got uh, the, our proposal granted by NASA, uh, I, I realized that we were gonna be only the fourth NASA mission to bring back extraterrestrial material. First one was Apollo, lunar samples. Then it was Genesis, the solar wind. Stardust brought back uh, dust from the tail of a comet. And then OSIRIS-REx is only the fourth NASA mission to bring back extraterrestrial materials. So this is uh, you know, uh, uh, exciting and I was very honored to be part of that team and, and even more excited to be funded by NASA to do this. Um, and uh, a little bit of a, um, of a summary of all the asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft. And of all of those, the only two random room missions or the only three random room missions have been the ones to uh, Eros, uh, then uh, Hayabusa 1 to uh, Itokawa, Hayabusa 2 to Ryugu, and then uh, Osiris Rex uh, in September of this year. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And these are uh, two near Earth asteroids. There's been two rendezvous missions to Ceres and uh, Vesta, which were done by the Dawn mission. Okay, so most of what we predicted about Bennu and uh, Ryugu matched quite well. The global properties, the spin top shape, the composition. So we had made observations of real group before encounter with mostly with radar. Um, and we predicted its size and its rotation rate quite well. With Bennu, we had made even more observations. We had, we had been better uh, characterized before we got there and turned out to be roughly what we intended, what we, what we anticipated. So we were so comfortable, so we were so smart. We predicted all of this and this is what we found. We are smart, ha, until 
um, we expected areas of coarse sand or pebbles on the surface. Essentially, the beach, half an hour from here, no big rocks, nice sandy beach, right? This is what we found, okay? So that, that rock is about three meters tall. And there's no sand there. There are really sharp rocks everywhere on better. And so, no, no, no uh, loose sand or pebbles. So the spacecraft was already there. And we were planning on going down to the surface with an altimeter, with a laser altimeter, and expecting a nice smooth area without rocks. And then we would just come down, no danger, and then come uh, pick up the sample and come back up. We had to change that whole approach. So the, the navigation team, and my hat is off to the navigation team of Osiris Rex, they had to rethink how they would do this. And they uploaded a program that made the spacecraft completely autonomous. So it would fly over the area that was going to be sampled. And it was going to use that map as a reference point. And as I said, if it came down to do the sampling, which they had two rehearsals because before we actually did the sampling. But as it came down to do the sampling, it was going to be correcting its trajectory uh, constantly so that if it was getting too close to this rock or to that rock, it would make corrections and sample the center of the crater, which was called Nightingale. Um, so uh, it all this had to be done when the space draft was already at bed. So they did a great job with that. And we, this is the artist conception of our sampling maneuver before we got there, right? So the artist expected a smooth asteroid without big rocks, no problem. And we we're gonna come down, sample and move away. Well, it turned out to be much more complicated than that. But this, I, I also use this to illustrate the fact that we had to come down vertically with near zero velocity and horizontally with zero velocity which was not necessarily trivial if you remember that this asteroid was rotating every 4.3 hours. So the spacecraft performed this maneuver twice before it actually sampled to make sure that all the, all the bugs or all the kinks were worked out. And then we successfully uh, uh, came down to the surface and sampled. What you'll see here is a series of images of the sample um, maneuver. When the head of the mechanical arm, the the, the sample mechanism, which we call the taxam, touches the surface, it fires nitrogen to fluidize the dust and make it go into the, uh, into the container. And it, um, there, there have been a couple of papers already published on this, but what we encountered was material that essentially no, offered no pressure at all, no force onto, on our mechanical arm. And had we not fired the thrusters, to move away from Bennu, the whole spacecraft would have been buried inside of Bennu. There was no, no uh, uh, friction, no cohesion. Uh, it, it was remarkable. In any case, we collected so much sample that the seals on our container didn't quite close. And so when we took images of the sample head, we could see particles just drifting away. And uh, I was at a meeting where we were discussing this and the head of the mission said, there goes somebody's PhD <laughs> right? And so instead of extending the mechanical arm and rotating the spacecraft to measure the mass that we had, because we had done that before we obtained the sample, so we're going to do it again and measure the difference, and that was going to give us the mass of, the, of our sample. We decided to just put that sample into the capsule, seal it, and head back to Earth so that we wouldn't lose any more mass. Um, and uh, so that, that's what we did. And then we did a little bit more of a reconnaissance of the, of the sample site, um, but our, the sample was safely in our capsule. Hayabusa 2 had already gone to Ryugu, sampled once, and they were not satisfied with that. They decided to, sh to shoot a projectile create a fresh crater, and then sample the crater, and then head back to Earth. If I had been the head of that mission with the training that I got from NASA, I would have headed back when I had the first sample. I wouldn't have risked the spacecraft with a sample already in it doing this very interesting maneuver. But my hat's off also to the Japanese. They have guts. They are much more tolerant of risk than NASA is. 
Um, and so they did this and it was remarkable. One thing that was funny is that in order to hit the, the, the asteroid with a projectile is they left a, um, uh, a small cube site type thing that shot the projectile onto the surface. In the meantime, the spacecraft, in order not to be uh, hit with a, with the debris, went and hit behind the asteroid so that the spacecraft would be safe while the projectile hit the asteroid, which reminded me of me uh, when I was a child and I would you know, light a, uh, um, a um, firework and then go hide and then let go see, let's go see the crater that it left over. So, so the, the Japanese took me back to my uh, childhood. In any case, the good thing is they already got their sample. They already gave us 10% of their sample, which is half a gram. So they brought back five grams. So they already gave us 10% of their sample, which is being analyzed in American laboratories. And they're, you know, they have some interesting results. And when we get our sample back, we're going to give them 10% of our sample. So we're going to be sampling at least two asteroids for the price of one, thanks to international collaboration. Um, okay. So um, I'm gonna now talk briefly about this, although I think most of the audience here knows a lot more about this because even though part of this is an American mission, DART, uh, the Chia Cube and ESA's uh, uh, era are European. Okay, so uh, DART hit Dimorphos in September of last year. And then just about 10 days before the impact in Chia Cube separated from DART, there was, it was um, attached to it, separated, took some images of the impact, and they made Dimorphos change its orbit. So it was a huge um, success. And uh, Fernando can tell us a lot more about that. Uh, he he, he uh, actually calculated how much mass was ejected and, and all the interesting things about how it was ejected. So this is fascinating. And it turns out that the behavior of this asteroid and the behavior of, of Bennu are somewhat related and we can learn from each other on that. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all very positive in terms of using this technique to deflect an asteroid like Bennu if, one, if it's uh, threatening Earth in the future. And there were many Earth-based observations, including uh, well, this was from DART um, a few seconds before impact. This is the last image before impact. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and it's a complex eject, uh, uh, and it, it, it tells you a lot about how the material was ejected, the sizes, all these things, the energy, the mass. Um, so um, ERA is being uh, built and will be launched in uh, 2024, so next year, uh, and get there in 2026 to study the crater uh, from uh, DART and other characteristics of Dimorphos and of Didymos uh, in detail. So again, the more we learn about the results of this impact, the better we will be able to deflect asteroids in the future. Okay, so uh, ERA is gonna do a crime scene investigation. This is, I took that from the ERA website, uh, launches in October, and then it ran the rules with the asteroid in, uh, in December of 2026. Um, okay, so the conclusions from section one, one and two, and then I'll go on to a little bit of my work. Uh, Planetary defense against asteroid impacts uh, benefits extensively from international collaboration. Uh, Osiris Rex and Hayabusa 2 brought back the samples, or Hayabusa 2 brought back the samples, where Osiris Rex will this year. And then uh, we got uh, you know, more and more interesting uh, missions that are testing this technique of a uh, kinetic impactor against uh, a, a, an impact of an asteroid. Okay, so. Let me tell you a little bit about some of my work on OSIRIS-REx. Um, in 2009, I was here in Granada at a planetary defense conference. And there I learned about 2008 TC3, which was the first asteroid that got discovered outside of the atmosphere, entered the atmosphere, and then was picked up as a meteorite in Sudan. And I was, Interested in that and read about it and continue to to to, uh, to follow the, those things. And it turns out that um, most uh, asteroid dynamicists or most solar system dynamicists tell us that in an asteroid impact, the 
projectile is likely to be vaporized because the average speed between asteroid in, 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 in impacts is about five kilometers per second. And so nobody expected anything on the surface of an asteroid from a uh, catastrophic disruption. And it turns out that I had been telling the team for about two years about this. And most of the team didn't believe me. Um, I was joking that they almost, almost sent me to Guantanamo to be waterboarded after, because I was telling heresies. Ah, if, uh, projectile surviving impact, impossible. But what motivated me to link TC3 with Bennu is that when I studied the orbits, because I did a, an analysis of the orbit of Bennu and where in the asteroid belt is likely to come from, it was from the same area where TC3 came from. So I thought hmm, maybe the two of them are related and we could have, in the case of uh, Amahata Sita, the, the, the meteorite, it was the most unusual meteorite we have ever seen still to, to this day. Instead of having one type of asteroid in there, it had five types represented. The Uralites, the uh, two types of ordinary chondrites, Institute chondrites, ordinary chondrites. And I think that since, I, since I've been following the literature on, on Amahata Sita, maybe more class have been discovered. So five different asteroids had to form, break up, come back together in a non-erosional process to produce Amahata Sita. When I saw the TC3, which produced Amahata Sita, came from where Bennu came from, I predicted to the team that we should have bright and dark uh, uh, pieces of the surface of Bennu. And Several people took me uh, seriously. Most people didn't believe me. Danny Della Justina, the head of the imaging team, the two people that headed, that built and headed the, uh, the uh, uh, spectrograph, and uh, Marco Del Bo from Nice, uh, which had worked on similar uh, problems in the past. So one day, Danny Della Justina invites me onto her office in Tucson, and she says, Humberto, look, didn't you predict bright objects on the surface of Venus? I said, yeah. She goes, I've discovered at least six boulders that are much higher albedo. And so, uh, so the, the reflectivity of these uh, uh, albedo is a solar system term for reflectivity. Um, so th these six boulders had between 13 sigma and 40 sigma above the median reflectivity on the surface of Venus. I'll show you a, 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 a little graph of that. And then, she said, not only are these things much brighter than the rest of the surface, their colors are strange. They have a drop at the longest wavelength, which could be cons uh, consistent with being some kind of a, a, a silicate. And then we got the spectra of these um, boulders. And, and I'll show you. Uh, they indicate a very particular type of, of um, silicate, which is what essentially lava is. So this is pyroxene, which is what we would find on the surface of Vesta. And it was so distinctive because Vesta is a unique asteroid in the asteroid belt. And it's the only, well, I, I won't go into too many details, but its spectrum is very distinctive. It, Vesta and the Vesta family are the only ones that have that spectrum. So we identified things that were much brighter and looked like Vesta. Then after, the, uh, and I'll tell you some more about that. Then we did a more detailed study of, uh, of Benno and we found 71 other boulders with a, the technique of looking only in the, in the camera colors we identified the, these first six that had already been identified by Della Justine et al. We identified 71 others. And then uh, Eric Tatsumi had done uh, a study on uh, asteroid Ryuhu and they, they found a number of, of objects on the surface of Ryugu that were also likely came from elsewhere, but their composition was more typical of S-type asteroids, which is are linked with ordinary chondrites. So this is interesting because both asteroids had material that came from other asteroids. So this thing about Amahata Sita being unique and, and completely unusual, is not holding up so much. And, but it's also interesting that Bennu has at least six, six rocks that look like Vesta. And Ryugu has many rocks, but they look more like ordinary conduct, like S-type asteroids, which is not Vesta. So these are the six rocks in 
um, it, uh, on, that was were published in the Telegistine et al. paper that we published in, in uh, uh, Nature Astronomy. And you can see that their re reflectivity is much greater than their surroundings. And their spectra, oh, I'm sorry. And, and here's the, uh, the average albedo of Bennu. It's peaked at, uh, you know, uh, four and a half percent. And it's it's a very sharp peak and, and between uh, about 3% and 6% reflectivity, that's the rest of the surface of, of Bennu. And our um, uh, rocks had were outliers they had an albedo ranging as high as 21%. So way over there, right? So statistically, they have they belong to a very different population based only on the reflectivity. This is where we found our first six rocks. This is the, the surface of Bennu. Um, and these are the spectra. So these are the six rocks that we identified initially. And these are the spectra, except for this one that doesn't have a strong uh, 0.9 micron uh, absorption. All of them have this 0.9 micron absorption, which was what Danny Delagistino was telling me when I first, when she first pointed them out. So when we got the spectra, we got 0.9 and 2 micron absorption. And when you analyze these, these spectra, they are clearly a pyroxene and not just a pyroxene, but the type of pyroxene that you see on the surface of Vesta. So we, uh, we linked Pieces of Vesta, and here's an, orbit, uh, an image of Vesta taken by the um, Dawn mission uh, on the surface of Venom. So uh, th these are the other uh, uh, potentially exogenous material that we uh, identified on Venom based only on the camera. So we have spectra for these six. These other ones, we have only the four colors of the camera, but based on those four colors and on the reflectivity, we identify them as likely to be exogenous also. Um, now, formation scenarios. So the average collision speed in the asteroid belt is five kilometers per second, which is too fast for fragments to survive, but they do. That's not a problem for me. I'm just an observational astronomer. I just report what I see, right? Now, the theorists are having a problem. And some of my best friends are theorists. theorists. So uh, we are missing something. So on Bennu, on Ryugu, and on meteorites like Almahata Sita, whichever process it is, when they impact each other, they don't uh, vaporize. They don't, the, the impactor doesn't disappear. So we're missing something. Uh, the fact that Bennu has pieces of Vesta on it um, is very interesting. And the fact that Ryugu doesn't seem to have pieces of Vesta into, uh, on it uh, is also very interesting. This can help us understand the collisional evolution of asteroids and the processes that form Earth and other terrestrial planets because they form in a way similar to the, the way that asteroids form. And um, it's also interesting that the samples from Osiris-Rex could contain pieces of Vesta. I hope so, we don't know. We will find out once we have those samples in the lab. But we may have samples from Bennu, sample, samples from Ryugu because of the international collaboration. And we may even have samples from uh, Vesta on Bennu and maybe samples from other asteroids on Ryugu. So uh, it's, you know, it, this is better than we had uh, anticipated. Now, what makes pieces of asteroid Vesta on Bennu so interesting? Well. Vesta has got a unique volcanic composition, which is very easy to identify. But why Vesta and not more abundant S-type asteroids fragments on, on, uh, on Ryugu? If you look at the inner asteroid belt, the pieces of flora, the flora family, which is an S-type family, are much more abundant than the pieces of Vesta. Could it be that uh, was the timing of the impact? So Vesta forms, it, got, it has two large impacts that create two large um, uh, craters, which are Venenea and, and Brasilia. So could it be the timing of those that happened before the formation of the flora family? We don't know, but we're looking into that. So because we know the ages of, uh, of uh, Venenea and Brasilia on, on, on Vesta, and we know the age of, of flora, we may be able to constrain the timing of when Venus was formed. Uh, which is 
you know, interesting and may be, um, uh, you know, we, we may be able to understand the collision evolution of those families and of the inner belt a lot better than we have anticipated. So, uh, and these Vesta fragments may have been the ones that impacted the parent body of Bennu and, um, and produce Venu, Venu. But again, theory tells us that the projectile doesn't survive. So why? Uh, we don't know. So, um, and so uh, in conclusion from uh, the, the last part uh, is that Venu has at least 77 boulders on the surface that are believed to be from another asteroid or other asteroids, plural. Uh, and it's at least six of Venu's boulders are from Vesta. Uh, they're much brighter. They have a pyroxene spectrum, which means which ties them directly to Vesta. And in the case of Rilbu, bright, there are these bright rocks that have uh, about the same size distribution of those that, that we found on Bennu, but are more consistent with a different type of asteroid. So it could be that the Rilbu samples contain some fragments that are from S type asteroids. So in which case we would have sampled, you know, if, if we're lucky and we Rilbu has pieces of S type asteroid and Bennu has pieces of Vesta, we would have sampled four asteroids with two missions. Um, anyway, uh, okay, so um, this is what my presentation was going to be until now. Uh, 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 Dr. Dufard asked me if I would comment on the pa uh, paper in Nature about the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the detection of one of the basis of the RNA molecule that was found on the Ryugu sample. So the sample from Ryugu is already being studied. One of these is one of the, uh, this is one of the results. And so uh, organic molecules in asteroid, oh, so first of all, organic molecules on the Earth are likely to have uh, come from asteroids and comets. That's because when the Earth formed, it had a stage which was called the magma oceans, where if there was any organic material, it would have burnt. So Earth and the moon both went through this phase where the surface was molten rock. And if there were any organics, they burnt. Slowly, that rock cools and solidifies and you get a solid surface. Impacts with comets and asteroids bring the Earth its organic molecules. And so in meteorites, these um, organics, which I mean, most meteorites come from asteroids. But the difference is that in meteorites, the organics are subject to terrestrial contamination. So they only study the insoluble ones because they are reliably extraterrestrial. When you get a meteorite, it's very difficult to determine if any organics in there are a terrestrial contamination or are original from the meteorite. So they, they basically don't even try. Uh, however, on the real group samples, which are um, truly well curated and, and not don't, don't have any terrestrial contamination, uracil was, has been detected. And it's one of the four bases for RNA, but not for DNA. And this is interesting. So this is, I'm just reporting on what was published in Nature. Um, this is particularly interesting because the people who think about the original life on Earth think that there was a stage of living beings that was previous to the current ones that use DNA for their genetic code, and it was based on RNA. So if they have discovered one of the bases of RNA, it may be uh, giving us clues about how organic molecules created the first living cell on the earth based on the inventory of organic molecules on asteroids as opposed to on earth, because on earth, all the organic molecules have now been transformed by Earth and any record of what, what the prebiotic organic uh, inventory has been erased by life itself. So, um, so RNA has been suggested as a stage of life on Earth before the current uh, DNA-based one. And the, so the uracil detected is an example of exactly what Hayabusa, Tour and Osiris-Rex were designed to accomplish, which is let's set the, the the practical question of both of these missions was, these are potentially hazardous asteroids. Let's study them to see if we have to deflect them. The scientific question for both missions was, let's study the inventory of organic molecules to see how, what 
existed on Earth before life formed and try to understand how life formed. So this is um, this result is exactly what we were hoping for, and hopefully this is going to be a lot more. Um, uh, questions, discussions. Thank you, Bertha. So, uh, and is there is somebody checking the questions online? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. First, we take question here, and then online. Oh, okay. So, question here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for this story being fantastic. I do nothing like this, and, and you got my attention all the many so going great. Um, one of the things that got my attention, though, is that you mentioned, I think, casually, that maybe one of these asteroids will hit the Earth in 140 years. Yeah. Like I mean, Benu you said it very kindly, but this is yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, very yeah, and, and, and this is, uh, again, our two main justifications for Osiris-Rex to NASA. I mean, it's like, NASA, give us $650 million. Why? Oh, because uh, this asteroid is potentially hazardous and it we got these scientific questions to, to address. And they, they did, we, we had to beat 13 other proposals, but yes. Um, so Bennu and Rigu are potentially hazardous. We could discover others that are potentially hazardous or we could discover others that are hazardous. But these are the ones that are have the highest chance of having their orbits evolve into something that is going to threaten Earth. So the chances of Bennu impacting Earth in 140 years are still very low, or actually they're essentially zero now. But we, we suspect that the evolution of the orbit could take, make it a hazardous asteroid in about 140 years. And so if we need to deflect it, we want to be ready. And one of the ways at which we're getting ready is uh, missions like DART that are testing this kinetic impactor. There are other techniques, but um, this is something that we need to work on constantly because the longer we detect an asteroid before impact, the easier it is to deflect it. And we don't know which asteroids are, uh, are threats. I mean, right now, none of them is an immediate threat, but we don't know what could be uh, discovered, especially among the smaller ones, which could be discovered shorter times before impact. So this is a whole area of, of research um, in the US funded by the Planetary Defense Office. And it's they actually have, um, there's a European and there's an American mission, uh, both of which would be going inside of the Earth's orbit and looking out at things that we miss because from Earth, those things would be near the sun. And so these guys are looking out there, they, they detect these things smaller, uh, easier, and they can go smaller, and they can study things that could be, let's say, 140 meters uh, uh, in size or, or greater, uh, that could threaten a city, not global devastation, but if they're threatening a city, we should try to do something about it. And um, if this after were to impact the area, what would be the damage? Like be Beno, the would, Beno would cause global devastation. It, the amount of dust that would be kicked up into the atmosphere would produce a winter that would last several years. All the crops would fail uh, and civilization would collapse because uh, if there's no food, you can imagine what's, what, what's gonna happen, right? It would be even worse than if there's no internet. <laughs> yes. Are there any chances that the borders that you found on Venus uh, are from another asteroid uh, with a similar formation to Vesta? That now it doesn't exist anymore, for example. It's, it's possible. Um, the thing is, the inner belt has been fairly well characterized as the inner, innermost part of the asteroid belt. And we know that in the inner belt, there is the Vesta family, which comes from these two impacts on Vesta. It's, it's, it's well understood. And uh, you tell me, you're more of an expert yeah. on that. But, um, and uh, it's possible. Um, but given that the pieces of Vesta are still there and they overlap in orbital space, the, the Polana family, which we think is the most likely origin of Bennu, that was the, an article that I wrote in 2010 saying Bennu is likely to come from the Polana family. And then I was looking at Amahata Sitta and TC3, and when I looked at the, the fact that the, the two orbits were so similar, 
then that's what led me to predict this. But there's nothing else in the inner belt like this. Actually, there's nothing else in the asteroid belt like Vesta. There is an asteroid similar to Vesta further out, Magnia, but its composition is different. Is different. Yeah. So it, it, it spectrally, it would look slightly different. So, uh, so the answer is yes, but the most plausible answer is Vesta. Or another asteroid that disappeared. Or an, or an other asteroid that no longer exists and happen to have the exact same composition as Vesta. This is why it would be, yeah. Yeah, and this is why it would be really fortunate and I knock on wood, I hope so, that we have a piece of Vesta in the in the sample that we're bringing back from, from, from Bennu. Uh, we're bringing back about 250 grams. So it's maybe there's one little grain in there that is Vesta. It would be easy to identify. In fact, if you see the spectra, the spectra looks like very different between them. Yeah. The second band center yeah. is very different between each other. That, that tells you a lot of uh, variety for variety and the composition is the yeah. difference. Yeah. So it could be difference in the depth of the crater of Vesta or in a approach. Yeah. No, but I I, I we did go through a, an exhaustive comparison with meteorites and, and we compared with Magnia and all that. And we ruled out anything that was not an HED meteorite uh, or the Vesta family. Probability is coming from the inner belt, which is Vesta. Right. But it, it, it would be interesting, for example, to do a more careful remember. This is, oh, we discovered this, we better publish it. Boom. Right. And uh, now that we have more time and that the sample is coming back to Earth and we no longer have. All the obligations for the, for the mission to look at this and start comparing the spectrum more carefully with uh, not just meteorites and Vesta, but different mixtures that we might might say, oh, this one has more alanine, this one has it's pure pyrotene, or etc. So that's something that maybe we can collaborate on. So you have some pieces of Vesta on uh, see the right sample. You can do uh, oxy oxygen. Isotopes, yes. So the really yeah. Well, if we do, yeah. right? Yeah. More questions. Bye. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, the first one. On the... I couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, my first question is uh, the case of the stuff that you find on the asteroids. Uh, uh, as they are located in the uh, um, one place on the asteroid, or are they homogeneously located on the asteroid? Uh, that's a good question. And let me go back in my slide um, to answer it. Forgive me for going so quickly. Um, so these in blue were the six original ones that we identified. And then in red were the other 71 uh, ob uh, uh, objects that we identified based these were identified on in uh, as a combination of uh, um, reflectivity, colors, and spectrum, right? These other 71 are on reflectivity and colors. We didn't get spectra of them because the spectrograph didn't recover the, the entire asteroid. And so they are more or less, more or less uh, um, e evenly distributed, although it seems to be a a paucity of them here. And we did not look anywhere below 70 degrees or above 70 degrees, simply because the projection effects would make our uh, uncertainty so great. We can go back and try to do that and maybe identify more over here. We just haven't, right? But our two, our first two papers were, you know, six boulders that were exogenous, 71 more that are likely exogenous, and among these 71, we seem to have two different compositions and from, just from their colors. So it, it could be that we have S-type material on Bennu, but we also have uh, Vesta material. No, no question about it. In the case of real group, they don't have any evidence of something like Vesta in front of them. So it could be that real group formed uh, after the, the Vesta material was no longer widespread or or it was hit by a piece of flora and not by Vesta. Uh, we need to look into that in detail. We have. 
Do we have a question? Yeah, but uh, it's the responsible vote. It's uh, do we know if we have some part of venue on Vesta? If we do, we know a, a part of venue on Vesta. Ah, that's a good question. Not necessarily, because remember, if the parent of Benu was sitting there in the Polana family, minding its own business, no problem, life is good, and whammo, it, it gets hit by a piece of uh, a Vesta, then Vesta itself would not necessarily be affected by that. But if the Polana family forms, or another C-type uh, object forms, and impacts Vesta, then we would have dark material on the surface of Vesta. That was discovered by the Dawn mission. They discovered dark, uh, hydrated material on the surface of an asteroid that's supposed to be completely volcanic. So the two of them are incompatible. So we do have pieces of C-type asteroids on the surface of Vesta, which is believed to be impacts that happened after the surface of Vesta had formed and was you know, Collisionally evolving with impacts of carbonaceous asteroids. Yeah, so that's that's a good question and a good point. We don't know if it's from Benno, likely from another uh, C-type asteroid that was closer. But yeah. you you want to show the? Uh, shall we show the? Uh, yeah. I, given your question, let me show. How do I do it? Um, uh, uh, rocks so. can move. Yeah. Yes, the rocks can move. Actually, they do move. So, um, this what I'm going to show is the video that was produced by Julia de Leon, a colleague from the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canaries. Uh, I was on her PhD committee 14 years ago, and she defended her thesis. And she said, "By the way, uh, those of you that don't know, I have one more figure for the for the thesis." And she shows us this video, which was professionally produced. And nobody on the PhD committee knew about this. So it's the Earth, we go by the moon. She teamed up with a, a professional video production company that did this for free. But um, we were going out from the uh, Earth, we encountered Mars. And now beyond Mars, we're entering the asteroid belt, right? And You start to see some of the asteroids and some of the dust produced by collisions between asteroids. And then they try to illustrate something called the Kirkwood gaps, which are areas uh, in the asteroid belt that in, in um, uh, orbital element space, there are no asteroids because of the influence from Jupiter and Saturn. And they illustrate it in, in, in a 3D version here, which is not realistic, but anyway, the point, they, were, they were trying to convey as much science in this video as possible. So in one of these gaps, they go in there and they accelerate time. And you'll see that the, the time is in años. So it was done in Spanish. Um, and as these objects enter these Kirkwood gaps, their orbits are changed dramatically and they get ejected. And um, so all of this is, is, is interesting until you get to the the climax of the video, which is coming up. Dramatic music. <laughs> yeah. That could be an S-type asteroid, which is the most common in the inner belt. Uh-oh. You think rainbow is forming from one event? Uh, not necessarily, right? So, so Julia went to this company 
and they made this video for her for free. And none of us in the in the committee, at least I didn't know anything about this until she showed it. And since then, I've been showing it on almost every chance I get because of it. And what I do is that every time there's a uh, PhD student that wants to get uh, his or her doctorate with me, I show them the video. And I said, if you don't get an Academy Award nomination, you don't get your PhD. <laughs> and, and they still work with me, but, you know, uh, I, but I do show it to them, seriously. I said, this is not what I expect of you, but it's an example of what one of the students in, in the Canaries did, went way beyond what was expected and, and used this for, for uh, basically for, for um, public outreach. But in any case, it illustrates how gravity will pull this material back and why Bennu, Ryugu, uh, Dimorphos are rubble piles. And, it, it, and so what she illustrated here was two big asteroids of about the same size colliding. That's not the most common um, event. Much more common is a small uh, projectile hitting a large asteroid at a high speed and because there are many more small objects than there are big objects, so the more common collision is going to be a small one with a big one, uh, or a small one with a small one, but the catastrophic disruption ones will be a small one with a big one. So in the case of Bennu, there was at least one catastrophic disruption, maybe more than one. But the more you have, the less likely you would have for material to survive on the surface. I don't know. Right. You are thinking in impacts. I'm not in aggression. Because you need to um, somehow break up the parent of Ben. You, you, you did it. Now okay. you have the material. And then you start to accrete here and form different rubble piles. So, okay, so that's a good point. So you're saying accretion instead of, of impacts. So the, the, the but, rubble survives. But the average speed between asteroids, which has been you know statistically uh, characterized from all their orbits, the average speed between asteroids is five kilometers per second. Let's say that there's this Agalgan and you have some slower speed, but still even this the, the, the end of that tail is fast enough to vaporize almost anything. We're missing something. It's not right? old calculation like for the bigger yeah. one. Yeah I think it's old and I think the calculation doesn't take into account impacts onto rubble piles and tangential impacts. Uh, and so, yeah, but there's no question that large fragments survive, right? That's a fact, right? You have bright uh, boulders on Bennu that have a very different spectrum from its surrounding. They're very bit different reflectivity, they're very different colors, and, and some of them are embedded into, into other rocks, some of them seem to be individual rocks. Uh, you know, it's yeah. even the morphology may be different from its surroundings. We we haven't looked into that, but yeah. But does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, Two days ago, I received a, a message from a friend worried because apparently NASA identified a new asteroid that could uh, impact in twenty forty six. Is it true? Is yeah, it true? and the chance, yeah, there, yeah, that that is a, a a valid detection. It will be back in twenty forty six, and the chances of impacting Earth is something like 0.6%. percent. And a, a relative of mine sent me a, a text message saying, you know, oh, and, the, and the headline was on um, Valentine's Day twenty forty six. There is. A likely, it's likely that an asteroid is going to impact Earth and ruin the day for lovers. Of that day. Okay. Um, well, and I and and further down in small print, 0.6 percent chance back then. Don't worry, because we have our friends. that's right. And since then, the asteroid's orbit has been refined, and the chance continues to go. The chance of impact continues to go down. Right, and I, I told my relative. I said, if somebody told you that you're going into this deal business that has a 0.6 percent chance of succeeding, would you call that likely? No. Okay. Would you go into that business with that person? No. 
Okay, but I just don't know how things are cosmically. The same, <laughs> the chances of it happening is still 0.6% or lower. So should you worry about that? No. Well, that's why I write to you. I said, yeah, but I'm spending half of my time responding to people to, who read these headlines. And the, 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 the press are very irresponsible. There are very few journalists left where our people are trying to scare us, right? Because that sells advertising. And, but they themselves said likely, and then 0.6%, right? Yeah, and that's lower now. That was back then, whatever, three weeks ago. Now it's lower than that. The, the better we understand the, the orbit, the more we can predict how likely the possibility, and instead of going up, it's going down. More questions? Any online questions? Okay. No. Okay, so we can close it here. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you for the extra slide. <laughs>